Well, in fact, uh, quantum K theory is exactly as uh, quantum cohomology is the deformation of the classical K theoretic ring. And I want to present some uh, basic features of this quantum K theory for some homogeneous spaces. So I first want to tell you what I mean by homogeneous spaces. So the base space will be a question G mod P where G is, well, say semi-simple, or oh, let's say reductive, doesn't care, reductive group. And P is a parabolic subgroup. And I'm going to assume that the Picard group of X is just set. So in fact, P is a maximal parabolic subgroup. And um, so I, I'm also going to fix notation once and for all. I pick T a maximal torus in my group, P a Borel subgroup containing T. P, this is my maximal parabolic subgroup inside G. And well, if you don't like a reductive group in general, you can think about G to be GL. N. And then for P, you look at some block upper triangular matrices. B will be simply given by the upper triangular matrices. And T, you can choose C to be simply the diagonal matrices. So the in, in this example, the homogeneous space X will be simply the Grassmannian of P dimensional subspaces in C to the N. Uh, and you know a lot on the quantum cohomology of this space already, thanks to Laurent Manivelle this morning. Okay, and I'm, I'm just going to remind you uh, the description of the uh, basis of the cohomology of this space X. Well, if you look at the B orbits of X, then you get a cellular decomposition. So you have finitely many B orbits. And these B orbits, so they are indexed by a finite set, which are partitions in the case of Grassmannians. These are called the Schubert cells. And, well, they are affine spaces. And therefore, if you take their closure, which are called the Schubert varieties, the closure inside X, the classes of these Schubert varieties in cohomology, which I will denote by sigma w, which they live in, so I'm going to denote by LW the co-dimension of the Schubert variety. They live in the integral cohomology of the variety x. And you have a basis of the cohomology, which is given by these classes. So this is a z-module description of the cohomology, so the additive description of the cohomology that uh, Laurent Manivelle gave you this morning. And well, you can do exactly the same, the same story if you look at K theory. So you could define O index W, which is simply the class in K theory of the structural sheaf of the Schubert variety. This lives in the K theory of X. And you have that the case array of X as a Z basis given by these classes, where you have the same index set. Okay, and while Schubert calculus, as uh, Laurent pointed out this morning, is simply to try to compute the multiplication structure in terms of this basis. So you want to multiply, say, any two Schubert classes, and you write this as a linear combination of Schubert classes. And these coefficients are the little root Richardson coefficients. And you would like to give a formula for them. And the same in K theory. So OU times OV can be written as a linear combination of K, U, V, W, or W in the same indexing set of OW. And these are the K theoretical little root Richardson coefficients. And well, uh, even, even though you don't, you, you don't know any, in general, any combinatorial formula for these numbers, at least you know that they have uh, nice properties like, you know, just by Kleinman transitivity, 
that uh, these numbers are always integer and non-negative. These are uh, enumerative uh, invariants. And you also know that these case critical numbers are, well, not always non-negative, but if you take, so you have, they have, they have a, a well-defined sign. So this is length of w minus length of u minus length of p. Uh, this is something, this, this was, so this is very classical, just by transitivity, and this was proved by Brion um, a few years ago. <laughs> okay, now if you want to introduce some uh, quantum theory in this classical picture, you need to introduce a moduli space of stable maps. And well, I'm only going to speak about genus zero and small well, small quantum cohomology or small quantum K theory. So only three points in general. But let me, let me first introduce this uh, with at least n points, but always genus zero. So m d n of x in simply the Konsevich uh, moduli space of stable maps. And this moduli space has nice uh, combinatorial properties. So the first one I want to introduce is the evaluation maps. So you have for each mark point an evaluation map from MD and X to X. And simply you take your map <coughs> from the rational curve to X with N mark points. And you map it to the value of the function at the east mark point. And you also have, well, the boundary components. And these boundary components, I want to index them in the following way. So I would denote by, yeah, OK. So D, D is my class in the uh, second homology group. Because my Picard group is Z, this is only an integer. This is a degree of my curve. And here, my, my D, this is simply a sequence of integers or a sequence of degree of curves. And I will denote by N index and underline a sequence of, not sequence of integers. OK. And I denote by this simply the sum of the di, which I want to be equal to d, and by, well, the same for the ni, which I want to be equal to n. Fine. I know the, the boundary components are, well, I would denote them by m, d, underline, n, underline, x. This is simply, well, let me just give you a picture and then uh, maybe more uh, precise definition. This is uh, just a set of maps f from c to x with n mark points p1 up to pn, where c as uh, air irreducible, yeah, air irreducible components, c1 up to c air such that I have ni mark points on each ci. And the degree of the map restricted to ci is just ci. Well, then if I want to get something nicer, I just take the closure in the moduli space. And in fact, this is just a, a, product, a fiber product of several copies of moduli spaces. So this is just md1 n1 plus 1, I guess, over x, fiber product over f of md2, n2 plus 2, x, fiber product over x, and so on, up to fiber product over x of m, d, r, n, r plus 1, x. OK, I pick several components, and I just glue them on some uh, mark points, which I added here. OK, this is. Uh, these are the, the boundary components. And there is uh, one special, special n bar I want to 
to emphasize, this is uh, the following one. Because I'm going to only look at small quantum cohomology, I will only have uh, three mark points. I would denote by three bar the following uh, sequence of integers. So either it's just one times three, or I put two on on the first component. I put the first two mark points, and I put the last mark point on the last component. That's that's the only two configuration which will really play a role in this talk. Well, you can, you can, you but can. You, I mean, in your formulation, because it's somehow, I mean, if it's a tree, then you don't know what's Yeah, going. okay, okay. If, yeah, here, uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> At least in, in this formulation, I, I did not consider a tree. I made a chain, yeah. Okay, so when you write M, B, vol. Yeah, this can be, this can be, yeah, this can be a tree if you want. Or chain or something. No, you can, I mean, you can have a tree if you want. Doesn't doesn't really matter. Yeah, okay. Once you uh, once you fix this this kinds of, of 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 points, then it doesn't really matter because if you have a chain here, it doesn't count really in the in the evaluation maps because you're going to pull back to pull back these things and the chain will not really interfere. I'm well. Um, well. Um, yeah, uh, so I, and the next, next thing I want to, to introduce are the gromov witten varieties. Uh, which are, so if I pick some elements, So these are these are representative of the Schubert classes, and I look at. Uh, so what do I? I look at. Uh, so I define G W D, N, of U one up to E U N. As the intersection of M D bar N bar X, and then I take the intersection with the inverse image by the evaluation map of some Schubert variety x u1 and so on up to the intersection uh, in inverse image by the nth evaluation map of the Schubert variety x u n and what I don't take uh, just the Schubert variety itself but I take general translate g1 g n general elements in my group Okay, so I put these Schubert varieties in general position. I take the inverse image and I look at all the maps which are of certain form and uh, which map my f e f east mark point to the east, Schubert east translated Schubert variety GI XUI. These are my Schubert varieties and uh, my gromov witten varieties. And if you look at the gromov witten invariant sigma U1, up to sigma u n of degree d with n mark point. This is simply equal to the number of points in g w d n of u1 up to u n. If the dimension of this variety is 0. So if you have finitely many curves which meet these Schubert varieties in the mark points, then the Gromov-Witt invariant simply the number of these curves. And if not, well, if you have no curve, then the Gromov-Witt invariant will be zero. And if you have a positive dimensional family of curve, then also the Gromov-Witt invariant will be zero. Okay, this is uh, well, this is another way to f to rephrase the uh, definition of these invariants. And you can also write this as uh, following um, integral over a moduli space of the pullback by the evolution map of the product of the Schubert, of the pullbacks of the Schubert classes. Okay. Okay, so you can, you can do exactly the same thing 
in K theory, and you can define the, the quantum K theoretical Gromov-Witten invariants, which are just so all u1 up to all un of degree d with n mark points. So we can just take the euro characteristic of the Gromov-Witten variety u1 up to un. So if you want to write this in K theory, you just take the shift you look correct, so the proper push forward to the point of uh, the class of O, G, W, D, N, U1 up to UN, which you multiply in K theory with the, evalu the Im inverse image by the evaluation map 1 of the class of O, U1, and so on up to the, the pullback by the evaluation N of O, U, N. Yeah. So these are the, well, these are at least what I, I call the Gromov-Witten invariants, k theoretical Gromov-Witten invariants. And the first statement I want to, to give is the following one. So this, this was proved by uh, Book, Chapu, Miyachia, and myself. So first, these Gromov-Witten variety, they have uh, some nice uh, singularities. So these Gromov-Witten varieties, GW, even DN, like this, U1 up to UN. These Gromov-Witten varieties, they have rational singularities. And also, if you look at the Gromov-Witten varieties for only one point, These are always unirational. And if you look at the Gromov-Witten varieties for two points, sorry, this is, well, with only one point, you put the point wherever you want. And for two points, you also can put the point whenever you want. This is either uniroot, unirational, sorry, or empty. So these, these properties are not, not really difficult. I'm not going to talk about that. The first, the first, so the first one, this is, this is some uh, uh, applying a result of Prion, which, uh, which tells you that uh, if you look at, at a general fiber of a morphism where the, the source is, uh, has rational singularity, then the general fiber with, uh, will have rational singularities. This one comes from the fact that uh, if you look at the evaluation map, the first evaluation map, then this morphism is G equivalent, therefore it will be uh, locally trivial. And this is just a fiber of the map. So this will be unirational. And it's more or less the same, the same thing for two points. And the problem comes when you want to, to deal with three points. So this, this, these are things I'm not going to, to talk more about. But at least you get some nice corollaries. And it's first that, uh, well, if you look at the one point case theoretical gamma witten invariant for any degree, then this is always equal to one, fine. And the two points gamma witten invariants for any degree, well, any, also any, uh, any boundary well, I didn't, I didn't define that, so I should. So, okay, I can, I can define this for any, I can, oh, I can, I can do the same definition, uh, uh, replacing, replacing the, the moduli space of stable maps by any of these boundary components, okay? And if I do this, I can just do exactly the same, the same uh, pullback product and then multiplying by the uh, your, um, k theoretical class of this variety I push it forward and I call this, uh, um, well, this is, I don't know if I should call it a Gromov-Witten case theoretical invariant, but at least I, I did not like this. Okay, and for any, any of those invariants, I get that this is either one. So if, if this variety is non-empty and it's zero, well, if it's empty. So you get this, at least this first computation of this uh, case theoretical gamma fit invariance. But what you really want to do is, uh, is an algebra which is a deformation of K-theory. So that's, uh, that's the next, 
next step. But to do this, well, if you want to define quantum case array, well, to do this, you cannot, you cannot do exactly as you, you would have done if you just copy the case of quantum cohomology. In quantum cohomology, what do you do to define the quantum cohomology? So quantum cohomology first. Oh. So you first define quantum cohomology as a Z module. And this is just given by taking the tensor product by the polynomial with one variable. Let's, let's take it with uh, a formal series. And well, that's, this, is, this is just a Z module. And then you want to define the product. And you just define the product by replacing the Richardson, Richard, little root Richardson coefficients by the gromov witten invariance. So sigma u, sigma v. This is just a sum over d and over w of the c, u, v. So maybe I just keep the notation sigma u, sigma v, sigma w. Here you have to take the Poincaré dual. And then d3 of q to the d sigma w. OK, this is, this is all you, you can define the small quantum cohomology ring. And while the first attempt you, you could try to do is uh, just do the same thing with case theory. But the problem is, if you do that, it will not be associative. So if you, if you do the following thing, all u, all v, all w, take the Poincaré dual in case theory, and then d3, q to the d, o, w. So this is not associative. So you have to, you have to, uh, well, to, to make a slight change in the, in the product. And this was explained by, uh, by Giventhal and by, by Lee. So I don't know if it, maybe I should keep, keep that black uh, So what you have to do. is you have to take into account the boundary. So you have to, um, to define these numbers, k, u, v, w, d, which is the sum of uh, all possible d's, which are sequences d1 up to dr, of minus 1 to the r. And then you take this chromophyton invariant O U O V O W dual, but on the boundary component corresponding to D and three. Okay, if you do that and you just plug in these numbers in the product, then this will be so the sum over all this K U V W D Q to the D O W. This will be associated. And this is, this is what I would call quantum K theory. So I have, I have to say that, well, at least as a Z module, as before, the quantum K theory is just defined by the tensor product with the power series in my quantum parameter Q. So this is just a definition, and you get an associative product when you do that. OK, so now what, what are the, the nice properties that we know on quantum cohomology that we would like to know also in quantum K theory? That's uh, the first question I want to address, or so maybe some remarks. Um, so in quantum cohomology, we know that uh, all the gromov witten invariants, so O, sigma u, sigma v, sigma w dual, all these numbers are non-negative. We also know that, well, in fact, this product, 
which is over there. This product, this is a priori infinite, as I just brought it here. But in fact, uh, because here the variety is finite, this product is in fact only finite. So you have that sigma u, sigma v, sigma w dual. D3, this one will vanish for d large enough. Well, this is, this is easy to, to, to check because you have this uh, dimension condition. And the dimension condition tells you that the codimension of xu plus the codimension of xv plus the codimension of xw has to be equal to the dimension of the mod moduli space, which is d times the first gen class plus the dimension of x. You need to have this equality to have a non-zero Gromov-Witten invariant. But if you let d go very large, because c1 is positive, because you are in a final variety, this, this is bounded by 3 times the dimension. And if you go, uh, d goes to infinity, then uh, well, you, get, you get that this is never an equality. And therefore, the gromov witten invariant will vanish. Okay, these are the two features I want to, to discuss. And there's also one thing that maybe I want to, to discuss is the following one, that you have that. Well, OK, maybe this is, uh, or maybe I am, well, well, we'll see at the end of the talk if I have some time to discuss this property. Which has to do with, uh, also with affine Grassmannian somehow. But uh, well, let me first uh, focus on these two problems. And well, then, then you can ask the following two questions which just come from these two facts in quantum cohomology, where you can ask yourself, do you have some positivity of these quantum, so k theoretical quantum intersection numbers? Well, these are not, these are not the, exactly the gromov witten invariants. These are the structured constants of the product. And you could ask whether you have the following sign condition. So the c1 times t plus Lw minus Lu minus Lv times this, KUVWD, whether this is non-negative. Well, this is exactly the same, the same uh, condition as in K theory, but just you, you just take into account the dimension of the moduli space in the, in the pictures. And the other question you can ask yourself is, uh, well, do you have the vanishing of these numbers? for d large, so which means that uh, is the product defined already over the polynomial ring, so in q. But do we have a finite product, finite sum in this defining product? So these are the two questions you, well, I want to, to ask. And for the first one, I don't, have, I don't really have an answer, except that well, we have some way to compute the quantum k theory of these homogeneous spaces. And we check that this, this uh, maybe 1 and 2. This 1 is true, for example, for all Grassmannians up to 10. So any subspaces of some dimension in a vector space of dimension smaller equal to 10. And it's also true. <laughs> for E6 mod P1 or E6 mod P6, if you prefer, so which is one of the minuscule varieties uh, Laurent Manivelle was talking about this morning. When, well, probably for some other cases, if, you, if, we compute, if we make a program where we expect that this will always be the case, but we, we have no, no idea how to prove this in general for the moment. And what I want to talk about is this second property here. And for this property, well, we have quite nice answer using the geometry of the moduli space. And the answer is, is the following one. So let me state it like this. So this is again with Book, Chapu, and Mialcea. So if if this chromophyton variety G W D3 
So for a irreducible curve with three mark points through three points, if this is, say, cohomology tree trivial, well, for example, you can assume that it's uh, rationally connected. This is enough to get cohomologically trivial. So if this variety, for example, is rationally connected for d large enough, then in fact, these numbers k, u, v, w, d, they all vanish for d large enough. OK, so this is, this is a conditional statement. But well, first, first uh, uh, Jason Start told, told us that he was able to prove this for any uh, G mod P as stated in the beginning uh, for D very large. But this is not written, so maybe at least some of, some of us prefer not to state it as a, as a theorem. And the second thing is that, well, we proved, at least we proved the following is that if x is minuscule, so let's, if you don't, well, I don't want to remind you what are all the minuscule varieties, but for example, if x is a Grassmannian, then, well, then in fact, this g, w, d3 of three points, this is always rational, and for all d, not, not only for very large d's, but for all d's. So at least for minuscule varieties, you have that this is an unconditional statement. And you can even deduce much more from this statement, because it's true for all d, then you get, you get sharp bonds for this vanishing. So what we get is the following. We get that, that uh, if x is minuscule, Then, in fact, you have the vanishing of k, u, v, w, d. So this is for all u, v, w, and d, which is at so which is strictly bigger than what I call d max. So what is d max? This is just the maximal power of q appearing in some quantum product. So cohomological quantum product. So you look in quantum cohomology, you have some terms. Well, necessarily in quantum K theory, you will have these terms. So at least the power is, is at least as, as big as, as this one. And in fact, the power is exactly that one. The maximal power is always the same one. And you can, you can explicitly compute these numbers. So for example, for Grassmann, and this is just the minimum of p and n minus p for the Grassmann g p n. So you have a, an explicit sharp bond. This is this is the best you can do in that case. Well, so this is this is not really uh, surprising since these varieties are final. Well, if you if you think that the quantum K theory will behave exact well. Some will like quantum cohomology. If you know that in quantum cohomology you have only finitely many terms in the product, then you expect that the same thing should happen in quantum K theory. So that's, um, that's what indeed hap happened. OK, so but I want to explain this statement. So why this thing on the geometry of this variety, which is, well, I'm going to prove that if it's rationally connected, say, then I get these vanishings. So that's what I want to explain now. So how does the proof work? Well, so what we what we have to compute is this. Uh, if you remember, this uh, k theoretical gamma Witten invariance. This k u k u v w d. This is the alternating sum over the d's, which are d one to d r of minus one to the r, and then shift your characteristic of O M D three X times E V one uh, so inverse image O U 
EV2 inverse image OV, EV3 inverse image OW2. That's what you have to compute. So what is this shift your characteristic? This is just a push forward to the point. So you want to compute a push forward to the point of something. And where instead of computing push forward to the point, we are going to, to compute the push forward to some other variety. And then so we are going to factorize the, the map to the point to some other variety. And uh, well, the factorization is the following one. Simply look at m d bar 3x. And you map it to x cubed by evaluation at the three points, OK? So this is EV1 times EV2 times EV3. You go in x cube, and you map it then to the point. So maybe I call this one P and this one Q. So if I want to compute the shift euler characteristic, this is just a push forward through this map, and I'm going to factorize this here. Well, what, why is this uh, interesting? Just because these classes are just pulled back from this map. So if I can prove something on the push forward here, I can apply projection formula and, well, hope for something. So that's the strategy. So the first thing I'm going to look at is this evaluation map EV D3 from M D3 X into X cube. OK, so maybe I, I need here to remind you a few properties of the rational curve curves on homogeneous spaces. Well, at least on rationally connected varieties. So let's say on homogeneous spaces. So what do we have? Well, we know, for example, in X, we know that uh, through any point, there exists a rational curve of any degree. Well, you know that there are lines in the homogeneous space, and you can, because it's homogeneous, you can always translate it and make it pass through any point. This is quite easy. Now, if you take two points, then there will be always a rational curve, but then of degree d large enough. And in fact, if you take any n points, there will be a rational curve of degree d large enough, just that the degree is uh, maybe much bigger than for two, two points. And there is a last thing I want to say that, well, through any two points, for example, then there exists a chain of rational curves of degree d1 up to dr. So this is my degree d underline, provided that this the sum of the degrees is large enough. So I can always make a chain of curves which pass through any two points, provided I have uh, enough. Uh, so I, I have, I have a, a degree large enough when I sum the degree of all these curves. This is always possible. OK, so once I have this, and I can prove the following lemma. The first, the first task is to understand the image of this map. What's the image of this map? This is quite easy. The image of, uh, sorry, EVD3. This is, so, yeah. This is simply the set of triples x, y, z in x cubed, such that, well, in fact, I have only a condition on x and y. So such that there exists. A rational curve of degree d1 through x and, and y. x and y. Okay, I'm going to denote this by z d1. So this only depends on d1 and not, and not on the sequence of degrees d1 up to dr. This is very important. Well, so this is true. Maybe I have to say something. This is true if d, the sum of the degree, is large enough. This is, this is always something I'm going to assume, because what I want to look at is, is this uh, Gromov-Witten varieties, or the Gromov, the characteristic of Gromov-Witten variants for d very large. So I'm, I can always assume that the sum of the degrees is very large. What I don't know is that each of the degree is large or not. 
but at least the sum is, can always be assumed very large. OK, so this is my lemma. And the proof is quite easy. So there are two. Well, there is one, one direction which is, which is obvious. If I pick an element in the image, well, it has to be on it has to be in the image of this morphism, and this morphism is just, it's just I evaluate in the point 1, 2, and 3 my morphism, and my morphism is a morphism from a curve of degree d1 on the first component, d2 on the second component, and so on up to dr on the last component. And 1 is mapped to x, 2 is mapped to y, and 3 is mapped to z. OK, 3 is mapped to z. So well, I know that at least x and y are on a, re on a rational curve of degree d1. This is just by, by construction. So now I need to, to prove the converse. If I take an element in this set, why is it in the image? So I need to produce a curve. OK, so uh, there I have two, two possibilities. The first case is if d1 is very large. So if I know that the sum is very large, the sum of all the degrees is very large, now I can say that either the first component has a very large degree or the tail has a very large degree. So let's first assume that the first component has a very large degree. Then when I choose, I choose a tail through z. Well, this I can always do because uh, I have a homogeneous spaces, so I choose a tail through any point and then I just translate it through z. So I get, I have my z here, I have my x and y here, I assume that these two, well, are at distance d1. There is a rational curve of degree d1 through them, but I'm not going to use that here. And I choose a tail through that point. So here I end up with a degree d2 curve, and here it's a degree dr curve. Okay, so I can choose that such a tail, and then I also choose choose a t on the curve of degree d2. I choose a t here. And now I have three points and I want a curve of degree d1 through these three points. But because d1 is very large, so I have to say that this d1 has to be larger than the degree I need to pass through three points, what I get just for free a, a curve of degree d1 through them because d1 was very large. So that's, that's, uh, that's easy. But the second part is also quite easy. So now let's assume that d1 is not large enough to do that. What can I do? Well, so this is like uh, 2. Well, I can assume that uh, then in that case, I, I get that d minus d1 is large enough. So what I need to assume on d is just that d is bigger than the degree that I need to pass through three points and the degree that I will need here, which will be the degree to pass through two points. So if I have this, well, I first, I first choose a degree d1 curve through x and y. This I can do because I am in this set. So I have my x, I have my y, I have my z, and I know, I know that there is a curve of degree d1 through them. This is my assumption. OK, I have this, and now I pick, I pick t on that curve. I pick my t here. And because uh, the degree of the tail is large enough, I know by the last property there that I know that there exists a tail through them. There exists a tail of degree d2 up to dr through them, through t and z. This is because the tail has degree large enough. OK, fine. So this is the proof of the lemma. And oh, well, in fact, you have much more than as this lemma. You have the following theorem, which I'm just going to call black box for, for the moment. And I'm going to explain you how you prove this later on. So the black box says that, in fact, you not only have that the image of this map is, uh, is this set z d1. You have that in k theory, if you look at the push forward in k theory of the class of m d 3x. So the push forward in k theory is just the class of this variety. Oh, this, this just means that if you look at the push forward 
of the structure sheaf, you get the structure sheaf of that D1. And if you look at the higher push forwards, X, then these higher push forward just vanish. That's, uh, that's what this means. OK, and so that's what this says. And in particular, what this says is that uh, this push forward, this does not depend, but does only depend on D1. That's an that's important point in this statement. OK, so once you have the black box, well, then it's just a, an easy combinatorial game. Sorry. Oh, OK, I cannot stop. Sorry, you have to wait. Oh, yeah. Thanks. <coughs> OK, so what's the a, what's a easy combinatorial game you need to, to do to get the vanishing if you have this black box? So you want to compute these numbers over there, k, u, v, w, d, which is this alternating sum. OK, and now I just replace psi by the push forward by p over there. So this is the push forward of the k theoretical class. So maybe, maybe let, me, let me just uh, drop x in the story. And well, also let me just write that this product of classes, this is just a pullback by the triple evaluation map of the classes of OU, OV, and OW dual, which I'm going to write like this. So this is the same formula as over there. And well, if I want to do the proper push forward by P, I just do it first by EV3. And I, I get from projective form, projection formula, I get that this is the sum over D minus 1 to the R of uh, so Q lower star. And then I get the class of the image of this push forward times O U O V O W dual. And now I can replace this by my formula using the black box. And I get that this is this does only depend on D1. Okay, that's a, that's a good a good thing of this story. So I get minus one to the air Q lower star of the class of O Z D1 times O U O V O W dual. Well, this only depends on D1, so I first sum on D1 of this class. And then I well I sum on the rest d2 up to dr of minus 1 to the r. Very good. And this last thing is just equal to 1 if d1 is equal to d. It's equal to minus 1 if d1 is equal to d minus 1. And it's equal to 0 if uh, d1 is smaller or equal to d minus 2. So uh, at the end, what you get is just two terms. You get that this sum is just the class, so the proper push forward of the class of O Z D times O U O V O W dual minus the push forward of the class for D minus one. O U O V O W dual. But what is that one? That one is a set of triples x, y, z, such that x and y are related by a curve of degree d. But if d is large enough, 
Well, any two points are connected by a curve of degree d and by a curve of degree d minus 1. So this zd and that d minus, that d minus 1 are just the same. So you get 0. So that's, that's, that's really, statement really comes from this black box. And this black box somehow will come from the cohomologically trivial uh, argument. OK. So how do, I, how do I now prove this in five minutes? So proof of the black box. Um, so the proof, in fact, just relies on the following theorem of Collard. So if you have, uh, let's, let's see, if you have f from x to y, a proper dominant morphism. Uh, you have a proper dominant morphism such that x and y have rational singularities. And if f is a general fiber of the morphism, so f the general fiber of the morphism is connected and cohomologically trivial. So for example, if you are rationally connected, then you are done. Then the proper push forward in case theory of OX is just OY. So this is really tailor made for what we want to do. Well, so somehow at least we know we know for irreducible curve we already know that the statement of the black box here is true okay because this is this is just the assumption i assume that that the fiber the general fiber so what my map is just ev3 so evd3 if i if i have a irreducible curve I start from evd3 i go to md3 from x, md3x to x cube and what is what is uh, the gromov witten variety for D3 of point, 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 this is just the general fiber of this map. So I, at least I, uh, my assumption just say that this is true for irreducible curves. Okay, and what I want to do is just uh, to explain, yeah, in the last minutes to explain that, in fact, if you know it for irreducible curve, then you can get it for, for reducible ones. Okay, so what, well, what do you do? Well, so why is, that's a lemma, um, E, V, D, 3, uh, as, uh, well, rationally connected. Let's, let's, let's assume that this one is rationally connected, and then I prove that this, this one is rationally connected. Or if you want to assume that this one is cohomologically trivial and connected, then I can prove you that, that this one is also cohomologically trivial and connected. But let's assume that it's rationally connected. So if EVD3 is, so is sorry, uh, okay, as rationally connected general fibers, that's what I want to prove. Okay, so what I want to prove is that the set or the variety of all reducible curves of degree d1 up to dr, such that the first component passes pass through through x and y, and the last one passes through z. So I fix x, y, z in z, d1. Okay, and I want that the set of all curves like this of degree d1 up to dr, which pass through x and y on the first component, and then on the last one, I want to prove that this is rationally connected. This is a fiber I want to look at. Okay, once again, there are two different cases. First, first, if d1 is large enough. So if d1 is large enough, you start from your fiber and you map it to, to the tail. 
So the set of curves of degree d2 up to dr, which passes through that. So what is this? This is just a Gromov-Witten variety with one point, so of degree d2 up to dr, with one point through the point. This, I already told you that these are unirational. So they are rationally connected, or they are cohomologically trivial, whatever you want. So these are rationally connected. And the fiber here, the fiber is just a set of all curves which pass through. So I have to, I have to just keep in mind that here I had my intersection point, and I keep it here. This is my t. I know the fiber is just a set of curves passing through x, y, and t. But this is just, the fiber is just g, w, d, 1, 3, x, y, t. And by assumption, this is rationally connected. So the base is rationally connected. The fiber is rationally connected. So I, Scarborough, and Star tells you, tell you that, that the top is also rationally connected. So that's the first step. And well, the second step is exactly the same. So yeah, maybe I can just skip it. So the second step is exactly as before. And you get that uh, in any case, the fiber is rationally connected. Therefore, you can apply, oh, I forgot to say. Oh, you want to, you can apply Kohler's theorem, but the one thing I didn't told you is that uh, I need that x and y have rational singularities. So I need to explain you why is this true. Well, x, x is this moduli space m d bar 3 x. But this is, a, this is a fiber product of moduli spaces m d x. And these moduli spaces, they have quotient singularities. So they have rational singularities. So this is... This has rational singularities. This is fine. And the variety, uh, the target variety, this is the image, because I need a proper dominant morphism. So this is just the image, ZD1. OK? So this is just a set of triples, x, y, z, such that, well, I have a curve of degree D1 through x and y. So first, Z does not enter into the place. So this is just a product of all the points x, y with this condition times x, so I can forget the z. And this condition, well, if I map this to x, I send x, y to x. This is a g-equivalent morphism, so this is a dominant morphism. And because it's a g-equivalent morphism, this is locally trivial. And the fiber will be irreducible, and it will be stable under the stabilizer of x. So if they are irreducible and stable on the, the stabilizer, which contains a Borel, the fibers are Schubert varieties. And the Schubert variety, they have rational singularities also. So I know that, that this variety also has rational singularities. So this is, this is uh, just given. Don't need to, to do anything else. OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> there's there's one thing there's one thing that comes also from from Affine Grassmann that that we may be are able to prove in this setting is is that uh, well at least this is something we proved using Affine Grassmann and in K theory. So you have you have a, a representation given by Zeidel of uh, the pi one of the automorphism group of x. This, this uh, has a representation in the so in quantum cohomology of x. And you, well, you have to localize it with respect to the quantum parameter. And you take the invariance, uh, the inver in invertible elements. OK, so this is, this is a representation that you can get from, from the affine Grassmannian. And this is, this is explicit in the situation of minuscule varieties. And this is explicit. Uh, so you have a, some tau here, which is mapped to a Schubert variety, sigma tau. And the multiplication by sigma tau is very nice. Something like sigma tau times any class sigma u is just q to, this, to some degree sigma of a bijection on, on the classes. And well, this is something we can recover, at least in some cases, in case theory also. So you get a morphism from by one of the automorphism group into the 
invertible elements in K-theory, and you have the same formulas, exactly the same. But this is, this I guess, is, is coming from something in, uh, in the affine Grassmannian, but wh what, we, what we can do to prove it is explicit computation and, and no like, general statement as uh, going to the affine Grassmannian, see the center in the affine Grassmannian and, and play around. This is, but, but at least in quantum commodities, this was, this was the case. Well, this is maybe something which has to do with the SATA K correspondence, but I don't know. You have to ask to Laurent. <laughs> Thanks again.